Hello and welcome to our press briefing on how to build a metaverse for all. I'm Kirsten Salyer from the World Economic Forum and I'm joined here today by a stellar panel of speakers. We have Kathy Lee, head of Shaping the Future of Media, Entertainment and Sport at the World Economic Forum, Huda Al Hashimi, Deputy Minister of Cabinet Affairs for Strategic Affairs, the Office of the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates, and Yatsia co-founder and executive chairman at Anamoka Brands. Um, thank you all for being here with us today. So the metaverse has been a big buzzword here in Davos this week. And we're here today to speak about what exactly it means and how we can ensure that it is inclusive. So why does this matter? The metaverse is actually on track, according to some estimates, to be an $800 billion market by 2024. So we're just looking one year ahead. And that will have serious implications for business as well as for consumers who are looking to navigate what this means for their work and for their lives. It also raises some serious questions about how we ensure these technologies are accessible, inclusive, and safe. So that's the focus of the World Economic Forum's Defining and Building the Metaverse initiative. This is an initiative that is made up of more than 150 members who are working on answering these tough questions. And there's two new papers released today, one on interoperability in the metaverse and another on demystifying that consumer metaverse experience. So Kathy, could you tell us a bit about why this research is so important and what these initial findings um, mean for the metaverse? Thanks, Kirsten, for that. Um, hello, everyone. Kathy Lee, head of media, uh, entertainment, and uh, sport platform at the forum. So the metaverse has been a buzzword. It's an evolving concept, one that doesn't have a standard definition yet. But many would agree that this new age of the internet will likely to um, uh, disrupt, but also transform the current uh, social and also economic uh, structures for more uh, immersive, empathetic social experiences to um, more universal access to education and healthcare. The metaverse does um, bring us a lot of the new opportunities, but at the same time, uh, tremendous challenges as well. So because of all of this in, you know, uh, interest in, uh, from business and, and also public, uh, public uh, the forum felt the time was right to um, start this initiative and really bring together the key stakeholders, public sector, private sector, civil society, academia, uh, to come together and contribute to developing a, a future metaverse that is safe, inclusive, uh, intero interoperable, uh, equitable, but also economically uh, viable. And that's why we launched the Defining and Building the Metaverse initiative uh, at our last annual meeting in May. Um, as the leading uh, international work, organization um, for public-private partnerships, the forum is uniquely um, positioned to bring together this diverse set of uh, stakeholders. Um, the work focused on two key areas. One is um, metaverse governance, and the other one is uh, economic and societal value creation. Of the two tracks, the governance um, track focuses on defining a set of uh, governance frameworks um, that uh, recommended frameworks that prevent potential harms uh, and also mitigate uh, emerging risks while ensuring equity and interoperability. The value creation track focuses on uh, providing sy uh, systems guidance um, to, uh, to prepare for the organizations to prepare for the inevitability of disruption uh, and also be aware of the potential value that the, uh, the metaverse can generate. Since the launch, the initiative has convened more than 150 partners and organizations, including my two co-panelists -pan here who are on the steering committee of the initiative, together with the two uh, working groups uh, exploring uh, the themes across both, tr uh, both tracks. On governance, uh, the main themes um, being, uh, that, that's being uh, explored are privacy, security, interoperability, safety, and identity. The value creation track started with uh, exploration of the consumer-facing metaverse and will develop to uh, cover industrial and enterprise metaverse over the time. Um, and in the meantime, we will also research the opportunities and, 
and um, trade-offs in access, um, inclusion, uh, sustainability, and, and well-being for those who seek to use the metaverse. Um, through months of intense research, uh, you know, countless of uh, working group meetings and certain committee meetings, and the interviews um, with um, constituents from all sectors, both sectors are now ready to uh, release uh, their first outputs. The first output of the uh, value creation track is on um, the is an inside report de demystifying the consumer uh, metaverse and explores key components, foundational technologies, uh, roles and and paths to economic value and, and growth in the in the singular consumer metaverse. The governance track uh, is launching uh, interoperability, a briefing paper called Interop Interoperability in the Metaverse. Uh, for the Metaverse to operate seamlessly, it will need to require a certain degree of interop interoperability for users to move, transact, participate um, across different platforms and, and localities. Um, the two tracks collaborate, uh, collaborate uh, closely with each other um, to make sure that the value creation in the metaverse is considered within a well-established uh, governance framework, while the governance recommendations uh, remain uh, cognizant of the economic and also social opportunities. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that although, again, metaverse uh, presents such significant uh, challenges, it could also be used for immense, um, immense good. Um, and uh, especially when driven by uh, purposeful and uh, ethical public-private uh, partnerships. Thank you, Kathy. I think that uh, oftentimes um, interplay between the opportunities and the challenges is, is really interesting. And I'm hoping, Huda, you can elaborate a bit on that in terms of actually looking at exciting developments in regulation to address some of these challenges. What are these exciting developments in the regulatory sphere that will be unique to the metaverse? And what do you think the most pressing issues are? Um, so first of all, I'm uh, super proud to be part of this steering committee. It's uh, been a wonderful journey, a journey that we're constantly debating and learning from each other. And I think the mix of government and private sector and providers and creators is really bringing this collaborative spirit of something that I guess we all acknowledge is an unknown and it's constantly evolving. Um, in the UAE context, you need to ask why, why we are part of this. Um, really, we are actively exploring the potential of the metaverse, both from a regulatory aspect, but also from a value aspect as well. And that's why the two papers really sort of bring to, to fruit that there is, there is, uh, uh, there is a tremendous economic and societal value on this, but if it is unregulated, then there might be some issues with privacy, safety, and security as well. So it goes very hand in hand. Um, we've recently announced our metaverse strategy. We've also recently announced our blockchain strategy, and we've hosted an assembly. So we're quite active in this in this domain. So there's a lot of exciting things that are happening in the regulatory front. And you might understand regulation and excitement don't go hand in hand, but I think in our, in our world it does. Um, we see that there might be an exponential increase in innovation and new business models, as well as connecting across borders when it comes to the metaverse, especially when it comes to virtual boundaries. We'll be talking about things like cross-border exchanges. So these are things that are quite exciting for, for expanding markets as well. Um, we want to stop focusing on reproducing physical spaces in the metaverse. I mean, what's the value of having a government office in the metaverse and ask yourself that you want to climb the stairs to that office in the metaverse. We have to ask ourselves, why are we still stuck in that domain? So we want to break through, and we believe that the exciting things that that, that breakthrough will happen. We also see that regulators will be acting more like referees rather than gatekeepers, and that code of conduct will actually take precedence over formulating policies. So these are areas that we believe are exciting. And if I could just um, maybe summarize it into four main uh, aspects, and I think you, you, you mentioned that, ethical and responsible participation, that's, 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 that's at the core of what we're trying to do. Size neutral, but also tech agnostic. The second one we believe is fostering passporting, and this is when we talk about global interoperability and, and the, the amount of, of um, scalability will happen when we actually do uh, support regulations and standards in that sphere. And the third one is on democratizing adoption, and this is about ease of access, 
acceptance, affordability, uh, safety at its core. And this is something that we want to be quite sure in the technology is actually uh, is really ex ex expanding. We, we see that they're really exploring. And, and unless that happens, it will be just for a few. And that's not what we're looking for. We do want it to be equitable. And I think the fourth one is supporting innovation regulatory sandboxes. And we want to move away from just talking about generic frameworks and talking and beyond declarations. We want to actually test these in real life. And the only way we can do that is through having safe regulatory bodies, sandboxing. And we're all familiar with that terminology. But what does that mean in the metaverse? And that's, I think, is going to be exciting time for us uh, going forward. Thank you, Huda. I think uh, regulators like referees is a kind of a nice framework to keep in mind as we think through kind of what these challenges might be in a constantly evolving playing field, to extend your metaphor. Um, yet, as we were talking about scale here, you know, how do we go from where we are today to where we're going to be in one year, in five years' times? This is where interoperability, I think, becomes increasingly important, as Kathy, as you mentioned. Um, how does this exactly help with that value creation? And what does ownership look like in this digital world uh, of the metaverse? So thank you. It's a great honor to be here. I think the important question we have to ask ourselves is the time that we spend online right now, uh, we create data. And that data creates value for, but for who, is the question. And it creates value for the platforms. And the challenge is that, actually, when you talk about data portability, what data are you basically porting from one to another? It's permission for the time being. And that means value creation in the current format can actually really truly exist to accruing to the end user because they don't own that data or the derivative of the data. Because after all, we can ask ourselves a question, you know, if we weren't driving Tesla cars, would Tesla actually have the ability to become a self-driving car? The value actually came from the people who are driving it. And that is true for name your platform, basically data paradigm. So what, you know, and so the challenge that, you know, we're still debating and discussing is around this interoperability. Interoperability only means something, we think, if you have ownership. But what does ownership of your data look like? It's not just your photos. It has to be the derivative of that data, what the value of that data generated, right? And so when you then are able to move it, imagine just from a paradigm of, let's say, games, which is another way where, you know, 3.4 billion people are playing games today. All of those digital items that they have inside those games, $200 billion of value generated um, last year alone. Actually, none of the players own any of those assets. They, they don't own that. But where this business would grow and is when there's interoperability, if you actually own it, you would have then the freedom to take your assets from one game to another or maybe create new gaming experiences for those who uh, want to create a new game based on someone else's ownership, as we do in the physical world. But that means we have to sort of, rank, sort of, sort of wrestle around this topic of true digital ownership and maybe digital property rights is one area. Is the answer Web3? Do we use blockchain as a way to validate basically this ownership? Is it regulation? These are all things, obviously, that we're trying to come to terms with. But I think at the foundation, if you don't have true digital property rights, then you can't actually have digital freedom, the freedom to transact, because it's always permissioned. So I think that lays, lies at the foundation of making interoperability benefit everyone. Thank you. Um, something that seems like it's coming across in a lot of the comments here today is really the individual at the heart of the center of how we're thinking about defining what is a very technical and a very um, digital virtual space. Um, putting people at the heart of design, Kathy, that's something that the initiative is sort of working towards developing. Could you speak a little bit more about what that means, and especially around issues of accessibility? Um, how are people actually going to be using that space, and how do we make sure that that really is an inclusive environment um, as much as it can be. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So when we think about, uh, first of all, when we think about the metaverse, we don't think about the metaverse necessarily as the end state. It's just ongoing digital transformation. And what that means is everything we're doing now needs to be translated properly into you know, the future of the internet. And we've been saying for years that human rights should be respected and translated into the digital context. That means that the rights that you enjoy offline um, and the, the rights to privacy, to security that you have offline should be translated into uh, online world as well. And that's why we keep preaching that 
the future of the internet, therefore the metaverse, needs to be human first, because human needs to remain at the center uh, of the of the design, um, and that comes with you know many different uh, realms. Um, for example, privacy, security, and safety. When we think about a lot of the issues related to the design of the internet, and many of the pitfalls we actually didn't foresee when the internet, you know, was born 40 years ago, we now need to carefully. Um, carefully think about how we can, how we, how can we uh, um, safeguard the future um, of the of the internet. Um, accessibility is one thing that's extremely important. We're talking about accessibility not only in terms of disability, but we're also talk. Um, so here we're talking about you know people who have different eyesights, um, different you know preferences. They may. Uh, we need to think about when we, when it comes to design of the headsets. We need to consider all of those uh, those uh, requirements and also um, demographic and and also geographic de de uh, divide as well. We need to make sure that this doesn't create another opportunity, um, another chance for the further digital divide to to occur. So all of those needs to be. Uh, saw through, and that's why, for example, even the, uh, for example, the uh, interoperability paper focuses on uh, looking at interoperability not only from the technical perspective, but usage across different demographic and geographic, and also jurisdictional uh, interoperability. Thank you. I think that point about the metaverse as this evolving next step of the inter internet is really interesting, especially if we look at some of the challenges that have been um, experienced in the internet thus far, one of which, of course, privacy. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to your experience, if you could speak a bit to how you see those continuing debates around privacy online, how you see that happening when we start talking about this virtual world of the metaverse. So I think the way we think of privacy, and I think, um, first of all, privacy, digital identity, security, they all go hand in hand. We already see that happening right now. If someone basically intrudes on sort of your personal digital space, they steal your identity. It's actually much more. We have digital reputation today as well. It's, you know, it's not just sort of our sort of physical identity. It's our virtual persona, our virtual image that is actually important. And so in terms of privacy, how can you basically do the things online, particularly if you look at something doing on chain, everything then becomes transparent. You see what you're doing. Is that something we want? Are there some things in our life that we want to keep private to ourselves? Uh, the data that we give, for instance, uh, we want to be able to get the benefits of that, but then how much of that should we disclose to others? Do we have the right to basically maintain that data? Do we have the right actually not to share it? Can we not share it, right? That's the other question, uh, because actually I think we all can assume that the platforms probably know a whole lot about us that we don't actually believe they might understand, or maybe they may even know more things more about us. How are we able to sort of analyze that? Um, I, I think the answer to us, again, goes back to the question of actually if we have a form of digital property. If we have prop digital property rights, then there is a form of a legal system. I think the protection on digital privacy isn't going to just be a technical solution. It's going to have to be one that is covered in law because we are humans, we are people. We live physically as much as we love to you know, exist virtually for many of us, I guess, and we spend most of our time online. We still need to follow the places, uh, the physical laws that we're in, the physical countries we live in. So I think the interplay and the combination with regulation and with government is going to be very important with that. Absolutely, and and part of this also is a constantly um, uh, evolving nature of innovation within that space. Um, Huda, as you mentioned, in terms of looking at innovation sandboxes, you know, how can we think through what's next um, in the metaverse? I was hoping you could speak a bit to some of these developments, these innovations, and where you see some potential for the metaverse to be that force for good, as, as, as Kathy mentioned. I think um, definitely there's, there's a lot of exciting things happening in, in this sphere, and we talk about force for good, we talk about human-centered metaverse, um, and we, we really, uh, as a steering group, we've been addressing that as well, and we've really put it at the core public value. And interoperability, as uh, Kathy mentioned, it, it doesn't look at just technology. And, and in fact, when we when we when we were debating this, it's it's really value to precedence uh, in all the different aspects that we looked at. Um, with with exciting things, there's there's a lot of exciting things that I would say is trying to mitigate potential risks. So if we put it that way, one of the areas that we're finding quite interesting is on mental well-being. 
and um, and uh, with the amount of time that we'll be spending in the metaverse, the hybrid between physical and virtual, it will take its toll on mental well-being. And we're seeing a lot of countries that are really actively pursuing uh, embracing neurotechnology and brain health into their regulation quite early on. So this is something that's exciting. It's very early days, but it's something that um, we should learn from each other. And that's the beauty of, of all of us exploring in, in, in this sphere. The other aspect that we're looking at is new forms of harassment and security and um, and safety and and the reason why there are new forms and it's actually happening in web 2.0 it doesn't mean it's it's something that we have to anticipate for metaverse is because technology is constantly evolving so the forms of harassments are changing and the core of what we're trying to do here is the only way we can tackle this is by being agile and agility is at the core of all of this and uh, and because we cannot see what's coming next if we see the chat uh, um, the chat AI that, well, that, that that's recently taken over all of the universities debate right now. Um, so it's either we anticipate the future, which at, at, the, at this industry is, is not as easy to do, or we program ourselves to be agile, to be able to evolve with the technology that's evolving around us. Um, another key thing is being proactive for risks and hence sandboxing those potential uh, areas, I think. Um, one of the things that we as regulators always dabble with is the timeliness of regulation. How fast or how late, and, and the report does talk a lot about that as well, is that how soon should we be involved or how much space should we give for the industry to grow and then jump in. And, and really, it, there is no right answer to that, and it really depends on the severity of the impact it will have on society, and at the same time, the severity of impact it will have on growth and, uh, and, and technology as well. Thank you. That's a really interesting point you brought up around mental well-being, harassment, risks that could potentially um, come up in this space as it has in the evolution of the internet to date. Um, Kathy, I'm hoping you can bridge this with some of the other work we're doing around digital safety and digital safety, especially in the metaverse. What have you found to be most effective at addressing these concerns? Absolutely. So back to the earlier point about we need to first uh, first of all recognize that there's digital rights, there's human rights needs to be pro properly placed into, into this context and that's the first step because if we talk about the safety in the Web 2.0, um, in terms of the nature of it, it's not that different from, from Web 3.0 or the future of the internet. Um, it's just the, the, the magnitude of the kind of content you probably need to moderate is going to be a, at a different level because we're not talking about only text-based or image-based um, you know, harmful content potentially. There could be, you know, because we're, we're talking about audio and gestures, so a lot of the ephem ephemeral uh, communications will need to be taken into consideration. And that will need, you know, innovative technologies to detect some of the, you know, harmful content uh, or inappropriate conduct um, when they happen. There needs to be proper ways of uh, intervention uh, and uh, appropriate, you know, risk assessment framework in place to make sure that we do design the spaces, um, you know, safety by design. So those are all the very important things to be taken into consideration. And again, you know, without a public-private uh, kind of collaboration to look at this, these challenges altogether, uh, I don't think we can get there. Thank you very much. I'd like to now open it up to the audience if we have any questions. If not, I'm happy to get up. All right, thank you. Uh, my question was uh, about the property rights and the value chain. Do, do you think the cats already have the bag in the sense that, that like Facebook already knows everything about me? I, I, how could I get, there would have to be some yeah, a lot of the chat, GP, GPT, I don't know, but they, they already know about me and I didn't even know it existed. So like, uh, uh, how, do you, how do we get those rights back when they're already seemingly been passed away? Well, that's a great question. <clears throat> I think when a lot of people look at, for instance, Web3 as the next evolution of the internet, where data basically is stored on a public database, which typically is typified by something like blockchain. It may not ultimately take that form, but that's basically how many people look at Web3 and say, 
things that are on chain in a public database means that for the first time we can truly own our digital assets away from these centralized platforms. And what that means is that network effects, really what you want is to have the benefit of the network effects that that data generates. But in a sort of a private database, you don't know what happens. You can't see inside Facebook or you can't see inside these companies, so you don't know its value. Now imagine in a future that would be potentially Web3, what actually what that would look like is that at the end of the day, you would know who had used your data at Facebook and how much value it generated. Uh, you would then know, okay, maybe you generated thousands of dollars of value for Facebook. The natural response for you would be to say, oh, should I be receiving you know, a share for that? This, by the way, is what Web1 was. In Web1, through information, we were able to transparently disclose what prices were sold for and gave rise for these transaction sort of commerce platforms, whether it's an Alibaba or an eBay, because I could see what the price of rice was sold in China, uh, sorry, in America from a Chinese farmer, for instance. I could they say, oh, you know, I want to basically charge more for that. More importantly, an intermediary might come in and say, oh, actually, I can sell it for some kind of you know, profit and I will pay you more and create a fair marketplace. So with Web3, what happens is that data becomes a commodity. Now, you may say, okay, Facebook already knows everything about us, but really it's the constant evolution of the data that matters. Data becomes stale, right? It's not valuable if, it doesn't, if you don't keep adding to it. And so where do we then move our data there, thereafter? And that's basically where the next phase, what some of us describe as Web3, but other platforms are building up to have a way of doing that. So, but you know, it's, it's early days um, in comparative speaking. I think that's the opportunity. And obviously platforms like Meta are also thinking how they play in this environment. We also have to look at, for instance, how did, Meta, how did Facebook grow? They grew actually through the API economy and who basically built those economies, other companies who built product on them and made, it, made them big. And for, one, for a moment, actually, they were offering it to everyone. And then they started to create restrictions for various business reasons, for very regulatory reasons. And then basically suddenly people didn't have access to it and they became you know, inadvertently deplatformed. Right? And so this is why permissionless is important uh, from, from at least our perspective. Because if you uh, don't have the ability to just change the rules at any time, as we have with physical property, then you can actually build a stable business. Imagine if you owned or apparently owned your physical property and the rules kept changing every six months or every 12 months. You can't invest for anything beyond the six or 12 months. But if you knew you owned it, you know, because you can have the, you know, for like 30, 40, 50 years, then you can actually make a long-term investment. And that's where interoperability and digital property rights matter. Because if I can actually make a long-term investment, because I know it can be used in many ways, and because I'm assured, absolutely assured of that ownership, then you can actually really enjoy the benefits of true capital formation. There is a sort of thing that, you know, in some media <laughs> might be perceived as negative, but non-fungible tokens is one of such expression. I wouldn't say it's the only expression, but it's one such expression of digital property rights. And we can see, for instance, what it's done for artists as well as for creators of any kind where they've been able to generate much more value precisely because they own those assets and they were able to receive ongoing royalties in a transparent manner because it is on chain. And we see basically some of those benefits that are forming and obviously part of the working group that we have here is to try to make sure that we can make this open to all and also do it in a way that is inclusive for everyone. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to end by just asking each of my speakers in one line if you could summarize your thoughts. In five years, what does the metaverse look like? What is your hope for the metaverse? Um, starting with you, Kathy. Um, in five years, I hope we are more clear in terms of the value that the metaverse could generate um, through different lenses. Uh, and uh, we should have more clarity in terms of how to govern certain aspects of it as well. That would be my hope. Thank you. Um, I hope in five years that it's not a terminology that people are still trying to figure out. It's an everyday practice that we don't even acknowledge that it's there because it's so ingrained in everything that we do. So we don't talk about the internet because it's part of our lives. So I believe in five years' time, the metaverse will be part of our lives, whether we like it or not. So I think the metaverse, I mean, I agree with everything, but I think the metaverse also will be entirely new national economies will spring out of the metaverse. Uh, like a virtual society that is real because of all the transaction value, because of all the commerce that's happening on it. And I actually also believe that there's going to be sort of virtual governance that will take place in the metaverse, almost like a new set of countries, as it were, 
And I think that's going to bring up some very interesting conversations. But these are already kind of happening. You could see that the platforms are actually at scale, like many countries. But with the metaverse, with ownership, we might have an opportunity where you could have sort of national virtual economies in which every user actually has a stake in it and because it is a co-owner of it instead. Thank you very much to my uh, panel of speakers here today and to everyone uh, in the audience and watching from home. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.